Hello everyone, this is Heist. <laughs> Who is it? And we're bringing you back to the Colorado Railroad. Isn't that how you start all your Colorado Railroad Museum? Uh, every single one is, uh, what's up guys, this is Heist. What's and up guys, back at you at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Colorado Railroad time. Museum. We're at the Railroad Museum. We're gonna you should, you know what you should do? Today. Okay, hear me out, right? You buy a bunch of property somewhere outside of Colorado, like a little bit okay. outside of Colorado. And you set up one of those, like, what is it, like 130 or 140 scale trains? You know, the ones where you, like, saddle ride them along the track? Right, right. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? And then, and then that would be awesome. I, I mean, that's that's like a dream is to have my own steam engine. Like, the, your little tiny one, though. You know, the one where the guy's, yeah. like, sitting on the tender and just riding the thing, right? And it's like... Yeah. And it's got, like, the little tiny controls and everything. That would be fantastic. And the passenger right. cars hold, they, like, um... one or two people. They make those in like seven and a half or fifteen inch gauge is what they call them in in the states. That's the those are the two most common. But they're like pre built. Really like there's a company right. that builds those, or do you have to hand build everything? Uh, it depends. There are a couple companies that make a couple kits for them. There's some people who build them for like people with lots of money, but right. most people end up building their own. I think at this point, really. So it's uh, it's definitely cool, and I, I would love to get into that. Yeah. Although I'm probably honestly more likely to build a full size steam engine because I have uh, problems uh, than making a miniature scale. Yeah, but you one, can't so. you can't have a track in your backyard for a full size steam yeah, engine. Don't, <laughs> okay, you can if you have a big enough backyard, I guess. All right. Don't okay. you stop me, Con. All right. Well, don't, anyway, don't we're uh, dream. we're back in Railroads Online. We got an update. Yes. Big update. Uh, coal powered locomotives update. So before we get into the coal engines and all the new cars and all that let's just talk about the new facilities new track new track three-way switch boom i don't stub switch i don't know what else to talk about with this it's uh, a this way one I, I will point out that this one's neat because it is a stub switch not a point switch so, so you're moving bends the rail. bending the rails um the rails really heavy for stub switches stub switches were actually like really light rail but they just used the rail that they already had so like, that's and whatever that's, and they, these would be like exactly like, like ties with metal like you see the ties are are nailed down here they're right and then here, there's the sliding stop. plates that you'd lubricate right and and there would be a couple more components but this is an okay approximation of a, a stub switch the thing that i do enjoy is that we actually get the first accurate usage of our denver south park and pacific harp stand here because this is right. actually how that railroad's harp switch stands looked with this kind of target uh, they would be opposite the direction that the switch is. So when it how much... target is facing left, it's diverging right, etc. Right, and and that makes sense because leverage, right? If you look the at the, the pole bar, there... that, that's how other that would railroads, to go. other railroads found out a way to do it much better. Uh, the East Broad Top just hooked up the bar above the pivot instead, and it made the switch stand a little bit more expensive to make, but it meant that their target pointed where they were going, so that makes a little bit more sense. Makes, but this yeah, is a, I, I understand This that. is a cool uh, Colorado prototype, so, so it, it's neat that we have one. How heavy, like if you were to try it, like because obviously you have to bend rail by hand, and there's notches, I guess, to hold it. How heavy, like how much force would you have to put on it to actually bend that? Do you know? Like, would uh, it be... it's uh, We have a three-way stub that's actually from the dsp &P at the museum. And it's a uh, lot. We literally have the original one, um, and yeah, it's uh, it's a fair amount of force. You grab the the shaft and you're yanking on it. I mean, you you definitely toss your body weight into it. So it's uh, it's not an easy thing, but it's not super hard uh, either at the same time. So all right, so that's it for rails uh, facilities. We obviously have a coaling tower now. Oh, this place is weird. I'm looking here and it places left. That's interesting. Oh, that's strange. Uh, coaling tower, so it has a rail here, I'm assuming, to load. That's where you dump coal, yeah. Dump your coal there. So that's there. the load rail. Okay, and so then it goes up this... the kind of elevator shaft thing and fills the bin, and then the, right. the bin's got a shoot on it. starts empty. Yeah. Okay. And it's a big As far as I bin. can tell, this is this is from a model railroad prototype from Walther's. Uh, oh, so it's like yeah, a model railroad here. kit. I don't know if there's a, an actual prototype that it comes from originally, but no, way up it's here. definitely neat, this. and it looks, looks right. How are you up in the sky? There's a ladder, man. There's a ladder. Climb a you're, ladder. You're, oh man, there's a client side desync because you're you're standing up not where it is on my side. You're just oh, floating. Oh, really? Yeah, and I try to climb the ladder and it- Yo, the ladder's uh, right oh, here, man. right below me. Go right below me and float uh, up. No, turn to your no, right. Turn to your right. No, no. No, it's, you're, it's, uh... you're, no tur stop. Tur tur turn right. Turn. Okay. Now, now go straight. Now go straight. Okay. Turn right a little bit. Okay. Yeah, no, no. no. Go back, back, back. I oh, I'm no, there. You go. There's yeah. an invisible structure. Turn right. Here. Turn right. No, there you go. Yeah, I'll go straight. Hey. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that's um. Yeah. The yeah. Okay. I can see the ties behind the structure where it placed. 
Okay, like the structure well, is entirely in a different spot. We'll have to. Uh, I'll have to place one of those at some point over by our uh, our round table. I don't really want to have coaling towers all over the map because they're that just... they're definitely a that's a big facility. And then we got two new water towers, which I guess just aesthetically they're different. This one's got like a side swivel as well with a little rope on it. I don't. It's a guy. Oh, it's a, a hose. Oh. It's a hose so that you can align the spout. Yeah, some prototypes have that. It's kind of neat. Okay, uh, interesting. I don't know how to get this <laughs> with to... jiggle physics. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to get this to actually let the water out though. Uh, there is a valve on it somewhere that you open. Oh, uh, up top. You have to get up on top of this. Are are you are you on top of another structure that doesn't make any sense? On yeah. My end? Do you not see it? Yeah. I the yes, valve. you are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, good, good client. This is some desync. Yep. Uh, and then the there's another water tower. Strange. This and this one's floating now. That's um. Okay. I can. Can I walk under it? I can walk under I it. I don't understand my end. what the deal is with this one compared to the other one. The other one's got the side swivel. This one looks like the same thing as the first water tower we had, except it's got uh, you know, it's a square got a tank. square tank instead that's open. It's just a different prototype. It looks cool. So that's it. Oh, and then the new engine shed, which is like a through. It looks kind of. It it honestly looks more like a tunnel to me. Uh, yeah, like, so like, I've like seen, a covered bridge, you know. I don't, I don't know what prototype this is, and calling it an engine sh shed felt really weird. Oh my god, there's a framed like, version. There's a framed version. Like to me, it feels more like this is kind of a car shop, and you'd put multiple of them in a row, and you'd have a car barn for repairing your cars. Or I've seen some people using them kind of as a quasi snow shed on their layouts uh, in roads, only, which is actually like pretty decent use. When I first saw it, and it was an engine shed, it was like what. But watching could, the way that people have kind of creatively used it, it's actually pretty cool. So. We could go to the smelter and completely cover the entire smelter lead track. Oh my god, this covers almost three tracks it wide. Three tra oh yeah, that's actually pretty cool. So you could actually, you could have a, a snowy covered yard in, yeah. uh, up in the mountains or something. Let's talk about the new cars. I'm in the menu right now. Obviously you can't tell, but right, um, right. the skeleton car holds logs, log flat, I guess. It's like a car with just a frame. That's right. all it is. It's a, a much cheaper lumber company kind of option for it's hauling logs. early game you... nonsense is basically Right, it's early game nonsense. Like this is what a lot of logging roads actually used. And some of them didn't even have frames. Some of them, they would just use the trucks and band the logs to the trucks. And the logs were the frame. Um, okay. This is a more advanced one than that, so we have a basic frame, but when you've got a bunch of really rigid, heavy wood that you're carrying, why waste weight where you don't need it? It so. seems really, it seems shorter than, have you used it yet? I haven't it, used it. It is shorter, and it only holds five logs, I've been told. So, definitely an earlier game five. car than what we have, yeah. Okay, and the logs, I guess, overhang, or there's smaller logs? I don't know, it seems... I, I'm not sure, I haven't loaded one yet. I've seen pictures right. of them. Well, loaded. I mean, I don't yeah. really see the point in us buying them because obviously they only hold logs and- uh, Right, that's, we've got a we're, whole, we're kind of past that at this we, point. Yeah, we have a whole arsenal of flat cars. Um, other than that, flat car two, flat car three, the same. There's a second hopper, an EBT hopper. East Broad Top. This is a, oh, a flavor of hopper that would make, you know, it would have been run behind the, our buddy, the Mosca, when it actually worked on the East Broad Top. Uh, also an earlier game design. Uh, it only holds eight instead of 10, but I think there's a bug right now and it only holds eight of like iron ore, but it still holds 10 of coal. So and the little bugs- Yeah, it's $100 there, but... cheaper to get by. It's a little little cheaper. You can buy more of them, but they, they haul a little less. So, you know, earlier game. Yeah, again, probably not applicable to us because we'd, we'd use big boy hoppers. Um... Right. Right. And then there's the regular tanker, which seems like it got a little bit of a revamp. Which is interesting. It's got like sure. a, yeah. it's got like a little um a little like spout off the spout. I don't know if that was there before or not, but it looks like a, a relief pressure relief. Yeah, anyway, and then they got the safety, coffin yeah. tank car, which looks like it would hold a lot more. Um, but it doesn't apparently. I think it actually holds less. It's cheaper uh, than, and heavier. Yeah. It's, it's but it but it holds less. It's so a lot old, cheaper. Yeah, though, the so old tanker was fourteen fifty, and the new one is nine fifty. Weighs thirty one thousand pounds instead of, instead of uh, thirty, and I think it holds eight instead of twelve. Uh, okay. So the fully loaded weight actually might be lighter still. But it's uh, way cheaper that, but... is the argument here. So you'd get it for yeah. it's like almost it's almost five hundred dollars. You can get three of these for two. Yeah. yeah. But you have to pull more weight. These are 31,000 pounds a piece, and the old tankers are 30,000 pounds a piece. Yeah, but with as much less oil, they're, they're actually probably lighter when loaded, I'd imagine. So. Right, right. I feel like we'll probably end up buying the regular tank cars because capacity is king, in my opinion. But Right, right. And the coffin tank cars are longer, so you need a longer train just to... Any, anyway, interesting. Uh, box car, and then they've got the stock car, which... Um, 
it says it holds crates of tools. It's like an alternate to the box car. Uh, but right. to me, that looks like a cattle car. That looks like an old school. That that's exactly what it is. I mean, old it's a stock car. car. It may not may not necessarily be explicitly for cattle. I mean, they would have hauled whatever in it. But it is actually realistic that it would hold tools because when the railroad was not in the stock rush season, which I mean is pretty much it's a seasonal thing. You're moving stock to market or you're moving the stock around to graze in different locations. Um, when you're not doing that, these are wasted space. So they would actually haul regular cargo in stock cars when they were outside of the stock season. So it, it you know, it'd be cool if we could have sheep or, uh, or cows or something to actually haul in these, but having them haul an alternate freight source is uh, actually not unrealistic. And it's kind of neat because it's so much bigger than the little box car. It's starting to approximate something that's a little bit more normal to the size of cars that I'm used to. Like this is kind of more your bog standard narrow gauge car because everything else we have is still pretty early, early, early stuff. Whereas Do you this know the is getting capacity of this in terms of tools? I don't. It's a fair bit bigger, so I wonder if it holds it more. Is, but yeah, I, it, is I don't a lot, know. it is a lot bigger than the standard box car. Um, I don't really think we'll necessarily, we might, we might just buy one just for fun when we do just our next flavor, tool run. Yeah. But we have two tool cars already. If we get a box, like two box cars, if we get a stock we, car with we, it. We don't then, need another one. Yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> uh, and then caboose, sta standard, standard, standard. All right. So now we get into the new engines. Um, so the 10 mile is the first new engine. 260. Yes. Oh my it god, is... it's got a triple. What? No, it's not a 260. It's a 266. It's a, 266. It's a Mason Bogey. So I was really excited for this one to come in the game. Um, it is a really neat prototype. So it's called the Mason Bogey because it's made by the Mason Machine Works. And the bogey piece of it is because the whole engine set actually swivels. So the whole oh six drivers God. actually are articulated and they pivot like it's a bogey. And then the lead truck extending out from that also pivots against uh, or from that six engine bed frame. So you have the, the lead truck, which pivots on top of the pivot of the six drivers. You can look, if you look at the underside of the smoke yeah, box, I see that. there's how actually the, a... How do you get the pistons to not... Like they pivot too. They must. The pistons piv pivot too, which is if you look at the underside of the smoke box, there's that red casting. Yeah, that yeah, allows yeah. for the blast nozzle to move left and right in the smoke box. Oh my god, this is it's, ridiculous. It's wacky. It's very unique and very cool. So it's uh, articulated of course, the, to go through tight corners, basically, is what the right the, exactly going around sharper curves. And so, Con, the funny thing about this one that blew my mind when I learned it. There's no superstructure frame that goes all the way from the smoke box back to the tender. Behind the drivers there is, but ahead, the boiler is the frame. Oh, that's they interesting. They stressed the boiler like it's a bridge. So the boiler is actually holding the engine together. There's not an, a separate frame. What's it's with these um, batty. What's with this like weird I guess it's I don't, I'm trying to check what lever this is attached to. Oh, it's the reverse. Your Johnson lever. bar. Your reverser Johnson so bar goes... with the shaft on top of the boiler. Yeah. So when you pivot your whole engine, you need to have a way to make sure that you're not messing with the links. And so they had to have the pivot for the Johnson bar come from above rather than below or right next and then to they like normal because it, it would on the, it wouldn't Oh my pivot. god, yeah. that is so ridiculous. It's such a crazy design. I'm, I'm really happy to see it come to the game because it's a really neat prototype. All right. And then uh, Class 48, that's old news. Montezuma, old news. Eureka, old news. Glenbrook, old news. Climax, old news. Heisler, definitely old news. The Ruby Basin. This looks honestly redonkulous. This is like... It's pretty crazy. It's a so, two, 280 and... Uh, 280T for tank engine. Yep. So it, wait, it doesn't have a tender. Engine? Yeah. The tanks are on it. So a tenderless engine is called a tank engine. So we would des oh. designate this a 280T. Kind of like the, the Porter is actually an 040T okay. because it has so, no tender. I had someone comment on this engine, and I, I want to know what you what this means. Someone said you should buy the Ru I have I have many questions about this engine. Someone said oh, you should buy yeah. the Ruby Basin, number one. Number two, they said we should do the pilot, no pilot option. I don't know what that what that mean let me get the comment exactly because they they had a comment and i i just don't understand i just i see that there's two pilots on it there's one on the front and one on the back right right so let me just pull up this comment here because they they made a comment um yeah if engine 13 is going to be a coal burner can you please keep the no pilot pilot pattern going and then oh, pe people so are like what I, does I got that this mean comment too i got this comment too so we've right. been alternating every engine somehow 
uh, with engines that had pilots and engines that did not have pilots. We just accidentally so, like, did that? On accidentally. Yeah, he noticed it. And I got this comment too. And it's so funny. So Ruby Basin has... Uh, those, those two pilots, which are the, the cow catcher. The correct right. term is pilot. It also has and if you three look at, legs. Like, what's the it, deal? It does. The triple pocket. We'll get there in a second. But yeah. bef be let's wrap up the pilot thing. If you look at the Climax and the Heisler and engines like that, they have footboards and stepboards, which is more like a oh switching pilot. Oh, my God. Pilot. We've actually been doing... How the yeah. heck have Yeah, and then the Class that? 48 also has, like, a switching pilot with the footboards. It doesn't have the cow catcher type pilot. So it's not technically no pilot pilot. They're different types. But it's actually kind of a fun thing that we've been going with that order then and, and it was hilarious that they noticed that yeah getting luck so but the triple coupler pocket is an interesting thing and and they really did have these and actually my engine 491 actually had one of these uh on it back in the day so if you're narrow gauge and you're running on dual gauge track where you're sharing one rail with standard gauge the standard gauge cars are going to be offset to the left or right and they have a higher coupler height and so the middle pocket is your narrow gauge centered coupler and then you have an offset so no matter which way you're going down a dual gauge track you can couple into a standard gauge car why the ruby basin has one i i don't know um i know the ruby basin was a deadwood central prototype uh, out of south dakota I, hold, hold neat, on a bit i'm, I'm yeah. confused i'm confused so you could couple into the old school standard cars gauge car or yeah. standard gauge cars but you can't run a non-standard gauge train on standard gauge unless you have that dual rail stuff going on you'd have to have dual gauge for this yeah so exactly. you'd have dual gauge and depending on which side the dual gauge is on your locomotive would be offset from the center but the the secondary coupler wouldn't be exactly that's what the other okay. two pockets are for and if it was left or right justified dual gauge right you'd need to use the left or right pocket so um we actually have some cars that have these and lo other locomotives at the museum that have coupler setups dealt to deal with that because the Rio Grande ended up having a lot of dual gauge tracks so it's actually a neat little prototype but it definitely looks wacky the first time you see it you got the cook 260 and then we've got the cook 260 coal but the only weird thing I had about this is they're different sized engines yeah so they say they like all the same stats they say that they're the same weight the same boiler pressure the same tractive effort but so they're different th this one's weird because the real Cook 260 never burned wood. Right. And so they decided to add a new model of it that burned coal, but they didn't want to cause the great engine explosion apocalypse that we had when we replaced other models. And they didn't want people that had Cook 260s that relied on wood and the wood infrastructure to be messed up. So they left the old one in and added the coal one in. Technically, the old one doesn't make any sense at all by burning wood and a number of the other but engines in the game, actually. They're, it's but... a physically bigger engine on the coal side. Yeah, so the, the model's made by a different modeler and is different. And oh, there's a lot really... of little different details. And us history nerds uh, will sit there and argue about all of the little differences and one may be better than the other and all that but sort in of real stuff, life but, like they only yeah. would have had one cook 260 like is that... yeah the 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 wood burn they never burned wood they always burned okay. uh coal and then later they got modernized and whatever and there's actually one that still exists in colorado actually but, I, I had another um, question yeah. too i just realized which is stupid uh back to the ruby basin on the front of the ruby basin there is a sort of valve uh, that looks like it's got a line, a water line or something coming out, and then a valve that goes onto the front of the pilot, the front pilot. <laughs> That's so, the brake pipe for air brakes, and oh, there's no for hose tying off in the other end air of brakes. Yeah. Oh. Which, which they modeled, because presumably we'll get air brakes at some point, I guess is oh, what the hint cool. is, but there's okay. there's no hoses. A lot of the other engines actually have that. Like, I think the Glenbrook actually has it Oh, the Cook has the one, too. Okay, yeah. I see. It's got a valve as well there. Okay, I see. Gotcha. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah, no, another one. Oh, that one's there. That one goes all the way. Wow, the Cook 260 has the, the brake line pilot going all the way down the pilot to the very front. That's cool. Bottom of the pilot. Uh, Class 70's old news. The ET and WNC280 looks like a rival to the Class 70 in size. Just a right. monstrous engine. Um, so this thing is really neat, and it might be my favorite engine from the new update. 16,545 pounds it, it's, of it's getting to be It's getting to be more modern. This is starting to get to be things that are more familiar for me. Oh my um, god. And ET and WNC stands for Eat Taters and Wear No Clothes. At least that's yeah, what the no, locals that's, will that's, tell you. That's exactly what I would have thought. Yeah, yeah, it's the Eastern Tennessee and Western North Carolina, commonly known as the Tweetsie. <laughs> and Western uh, North Carolina. 
Yes. <laughs> there was a small yeah, three-foot gate the Carolinas right there. into north and south, and they realized that wasn't enough, so they went with the western, western and the north. eastern. <laughs> yes, precisely. <laughs> so they had to subdivide it further. Oh, uh, God. But it, it's commonly known by as the Tweetsie by pretty much everybody. The Tweetsie? Uh, so it's the Tweetsie. That's, that's how they ended up, like actually shortening the name that's the nickname so it's it's actually a really cool railroad and and some of it survives and some of the engines survive as well uh not the 280 i don't think but it's neat and it's got a weird long smoke box and it's a it's a cool looking engine uh, definitely expensive though and it does rival the class 70 in terms of power although uh the more i've been researching the more convoluted the history of the class 70 is and it's actually probably underpowered in game but that's a, that's a discussion for another day it has so. <laughs> modern couplers it has a. It does. It has a, knuckle couplers with a split knuckle, so you can still put links and pins in them. Right. Um, it's. I think it's interesting that they included the couplers because the engine probably never had link and pin being built in 1903. So accurate for it to have the knuckle couplers. Uh, the knuckle couplers are just models. They don't. Uh, they're not interactable. The pins don't move or anything. And but like you that... can then put a link in the split knuckle, which is definitely a thing that we we actually have a bunch of them at the museum. You put a, a link in there, and then you put a pin through the knuckle, and then you can adapt this to link and pin. So uh, it's interesting that they chose to add the couplers and not make them function. But uh, it can so still the run split with all the knuckle coupler—that's a real—that's a real thing. That was like that back is a real when thing. they were transitioning from one to the like other. That. And then I've noticed they've got like a chain with a big bar, so you would just grab the bar from the outside of the gauge, swivel it up, it would pull the knuckle apart, basically. Yeah, that's called your cut lever or your pin lifter, depending on which slang you like to use. Right. But it pulls the actual pin that the, the weight of the train is being transmitted through. That's so, neat. Knuckles are, are really cool, and uh, hopefully come by the museum someday so I can show you them up person, because they're actually mechanically genius. Because uh, if you look at the knuckle, and you look at the coupler, and and where the actual fingers of the knuckle are, you can see there's a big pin that they would swivel around to open them up. Right. And that pin, when the train is being pulled, that pin has no force on it. Okay, so uh, we have, I have eight grand. I mean, obviously I've got, I've got lots of money, uh, I think. Yeah, eight grand. So we could buy literally whatever we want. Um, is this engine number 13? It is engine 13, whichever one we buy. I yeah. don't really feel like buying the Heisler for 13, no offense, but, uh, I kind of want to go big or go home and uh, get, you know, this $7,000 ET. It would be nice to have some some serious motive power. Something that could just pull and not care. So uh, I feel like that's what we're going to do. This is number 13. Tweetsie boy. Uh, yeah, and you've got options of straight stack, capped stack, and then you, the onion. <laughs> have we been doing C.R.A.P on the tenders? Uh, we, we do Central Rio ampersand Pacific. Yeah, uh, I just don't think, I don't know if that see. can fit. Paci oh, no, it can. Okay, Central Rio and Pacific, it does. Okay, perfect. Uh, Nabe, what's it called? Tweetsie? Tweet How do you spell that? T-W-E-E-T-S-I-E. -E -E. Tweetsie. And then you've also got different options, a headlight, and if you get an electric headlight, you get a dynamo and everything, so it can be pretty modern. My vote would be for one of the round case, not box headlights, but one of the round headlights, uh, so that we can feel modern. Like headlight option. Oh God, when you when you scroll through your buy menu, it changes the headlights. On yours? On my, yeah, that that one. Yes, that one. Option that one's four. electric with a yeah. dynamo. You can see the dynamo there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then paint scheme. I mean, you've kind of got the the olive and the Russian iron jacket. Then you've got olive and black jacket. And then you've just got black. And uh, I think the black and white. I mean, that really screams a little bit more modern uh, railroading. And by modern railroading, I mean like 1905. The black with the white walled but, wheels. Because like, it's, it's pretty cool. That's a pretty slick look with the red with the red doors. That's what we're going with. I, I think that would be cool. That, that would All be right. my vote. What about smokestacks? Oh God, smokestack it, number three. What? Yeah, happened? The, the onion. Yeah, the onion. A, what is that? What is that pipeline coming out of it there? What is that? That is a that's a clean out so that you can clean soot and cinders out of the the, oh, the screen. Oh God, there. that is the um, onion. That is that looks. Yeah, I don't. Terrible. I don't know. I can't remember the actual name of that one and and why it was a thing, but some roads used it. Um, I would prefer just the shotgun stack. That's a that's a chungus right there. That is a big, that is big, a big big, big two eight zero engine. Wow, it's great. Get We're some, gonna have tractive uh, get power some, now. We got to put some coal in the hole, Cotton. This How do we is, do that? This is the first time. So you you come up to the the tender and and then you left click the coal pile and you get a shovel and then you right click and it tosses it. Oh, perfect. Yeah. 
And then you can see that there's a kind hey, of Hey, you know where I store my shovel? Where? I'm not gonna uh, tell somewhere? you. Somewhere in, in the void? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a it's a long it's a long handle, and I pulled it out of a, a cavity, and then I put it's, it. Uh, oh oh, that, you know. the the end of that handle's real wide, bro. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, it's yeah. uh, it's I I've okay. uh, you know I've I I I know what I'm doing. So one neat thing about this model, I mean, it includes the bifold cab doors, which blew my brain. I've never seen rear cab doors that are folding like this, so that's pretty cool. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and then it, it's actually got the flip down seats modeled, which a lot of the under, other engines don't have modeled yet, where the the seats are actually attached to the cab wall, and then there's one pole uh, that you just kind of get set vaguely straight up and down so the seat can do its thing. They got rid of the moonwalking, which if uh, like I guess you can you can demonstrate. It. So if you put your reverser in full reverse while going full forward, reverse. yep, it, it will slow you, you down. down, but your wheels stay spinning forward. Which is way more accurate. Which makes than sense. Just yes, you're reversing backwards. the valve positions, which means the steam is going into the other side of the piston, and it is therefore slowing you down rather than speeding you up. Acts like a like a Jake brake or a right. semi truck brake instead of, you know, but, if, if you really really had bad friction, if it was like icy, you could get the wheels to go the other way, but that would be kind of impressive. Right, so. but then if you put a hundred percent brake, that happens where you lock your wheels. Oh yeah, I just what? slid them flat. And I was you looking. need to keep going, by the way. But I don't understand. Uh, I feel like that wouldn't happen in real life where you could lock your wheels. I feel, I don't know. Obviously, it I've depends. Never... It depends on how the brake rigging is set up. Um, usually, you design the system and set up your feed valves so that you can't lock up the drive wheels. Right. Because if you lock up wheels, that's a bad day. Um, and, and also, you end up with sliding friction, and, and which is rolling friction, uh, instead of a true static friction which is what the actual friction you get is with wheels um so you end up having less effective brakes if you do slide which is an interesting thing but a very very bad thing to do so you can adjust the pressure being sent to the brake cylinders on the engine with the independent so even if you come all the way over hard over with the valve it, it won't apply it so much that you can slide it but there are certainly uh, occasions when it's like icy out or wet out or whatever that you can slide the wheels if you're not careful. So it's definitely something you gotta keep in mind. Now, if you slide your wheels, you're gonna, first of all, I noticed this engine's got three blind drivers. The front three are all blind. Uh, looks that's like, weird. It looks like the back one isn't. The back one is a flange. The front three are all blind, and then the leading wheels obviously are flanged. That doesn't make any sense. Or no, it's the, no, no, the front one's got a flange too, the, so the middle the, two are blind. Okay, that makes more sense. It's hard to tell if the motion blows. Yeah, it is. Now, it, but, no, yeah, the front one's um, got a flange, the middle two are blind, and the back one's got a flange. Right. Okay, that yeah, makes more sense. That's kind of interesting. Um, so if you flat spot a train wheel, yeah, I mean in F one they do it all the time. They lock the brakes, flat spot a wheel, because uh, the brakes don't have any anti lock braking and they're very powerful. So, you know, they flat spot a wheel. They have one of two options: either a, run the car until the flat spot wears out and the wheel becomes smooth cam, or B, uh, take the car in and swap the tires out in a couple seconds, which I'm assuming with trains, we can't exactly do that. So, right. uh, you know. So, what's the, you what do you are do allowed, if you flat spot a wheel? Per, per the FRA, you are allowed a flat spot that is up to two and a half inches long. And if you have multiple flat spots in the same place, uh, or very adjacent to each other, I'm grabbing the brake instead of the regulator, my bad. Um, if you have multiple flat spots that are right next to each other, uh, you, they can only be like two inches a piece if there's two or more. So you can have a flat spot on your wheel, but obviously it's not ideal because you start impacting the track pretty well, significantly. The yeah, and the train would rattle, spots. wouldn't it? It would like bounce a little bit. Like Yes, goodness, he good heavens. I mean, you can hear it anytime a train goes by. Uh, every freight train in the U.S. at this point has flat spots on some of the wheels. Like, that's a guarantee. So like, on the cars mainly? Or the on the cars, yeah. On, main, mainly on the cars. Locomotives tend to get taken care of at a, a little bit of a higher standard just because there's so many fewer of them versus right. the cars. Um, and, and the cars have the same standard, too. So it's not like they're running out there with flat spots that are illegal or anything. They're running out there with smaller flat spots. But you hear them go, dunk, 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 as they go past. Um... And so the car, you just change the wheel set out. With the locomotives, you actually will recut the tires. So on a steam engine, you could take the wheel sets out, put them on a giant lathe, and reprofile the tires. 
Uh, and once you get down to minimum thickness, you have to take the tires off and put new tires okay, on okay. using a giant hold gas Hold on a minute, ring. hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Because let's, let's talk some technical stuff. A lathe, for anybody who doesn't know, big, big machining device that lets you rotate a big, part. Big and as the part boy. rotates, yeah. you put a, a cutting bit in and the cutting bit removes material from the part that you're cutting. So you can make very perfectly circular things. You can also do all sorts of other nonsense on a lathe, no problem. Yeah, but and the, the cutting bit is super, super hard. So it's super it's like hard, you're ripping and a you piece use of a paper lot of a lot of lubricant yeah. to prevent it from wearing down fast and all that stuff. But yes, if you cut out, let's say you take out the middle axle and you cut the tire down with a lathe to remove the flat spot. Now you have a tire that's a smaller diameter than the rest of them. So yeah. how would you account for that? You have to take all of the wheels out and you have to reprofile all the wheels and make sure they're they all a have to be amount. the same on the whole locomotive. Correct. For a oh, steam engine, yes. For God. a diesel locomotive, it's different. Well, um, the modern one, do they have, they, I guess each one has individual suspension, which pushes it down to the track regardless of the size? Or? Yes and no. So modern wheels, is it lumber or beams for the coal beams, one? I can never beams. remember. Okay. Um, with modern diesels, uh, if it's a Jeep, aka a four axle diesel, the wheels, it does not matter. You could have a brand new wheel and you could have a scrap wheel size, like itty bitty wheel on the same truck. And there's no problem. But if you have a six axle, because the truck is the rigid body, if you have enough of a difference between the wheels in a truck or between the trucks themselves, you can end up picking one of the wheels off the rail or causing tipping, uh, you know, kind of like a seesaw. How, how would that work and so they the regulate drive, that? Because wouldn't the drive be powering both wheels with the same torque from the same motor? So like one would spin technically less... Fast. One is technically giving you more power than the other, yes. Yeah. But the size difference is so... You're talking about eighths of an inch, if that, on a diameter. Okay. And so it really doesn't add up to be that big of a problem for you. Gotcha. But if, if you have extre like a Jeep with extremely different sized wheels, you will notice that it's a little bit more prone to slipping. So it's not ideal, but you can definitely do it. And guess what? The railroad really does. But steam engines, if you have different sized wheels, it changes the... Uh, Changes the ride height, changes a whole bunch of different oh, stuff, so that, that doesn't work. Go for it a little more. Half okay. a car, the, the back one's not loading proper. So flat spot's bad. Try not to make flat spots. Um, we've definitely had our fair share. I mean, every railroad runs into it. So we've had it at the museum. Um, we've had cars get flat spots. Somebody forgets to kick the handbrake off or something, and then you add air to it, and then it's applying harder than you think, or it's icy, and it's really easy for the wheels to slide. Um, there's all sorts of things that can cause it, and it, it's genuinely a pretty bad day. Uh, for an easy understanding of how bad flat spots are... A head two. A head two. A big modern diesel locomotive is like 450,000 pounds-ish. And so you're distributing that 450,000 pounds across, normally, 12 wheels. So you should have a plus half. or minus some... Um, is that still okay? Oh, no, you're good no, there. Yeah, you might have, yeah, it should be fine. So diesel, like 450,000 pounds. So you realize you're dividing that by 12 for each weight per wheel. I had to. And you're ending up with, uh, oh, God, that, that's quick math to do in my head. It's 45 divided by 12. Three something, right? Uh, three point uh, five. No, wait, hold on a minute. Hold so on. like 30, 35,000-ish pounds? It's actually Should like 3.7 3. something because it's like... 3.7 something. Because it's, well, because it's like, or 3.8 because it's, uh, what? It would be three would be 36, 45 minus 36 is nine. So it's like 3.75 exactly. Yeah. Okay. So Quick math. 37,500 pounds per wheel-ish. We would get locomotives that would tick the wild wheel detector is what it was called, which is a pressure sensor in the track for the weight of the locomotives. And they would automatically get a defect put on them for like wild wheel, 90 kips, which is kilopounds, which is a stupid unit, but it's what people use. So 90,000 pounds from one wheel. So you're talking about triple the loading. I mean, I saw some that were like 120, 130, and they right, would come in you. and they would have gigantic flat spots. How, 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 okay. I don't understand. So one wheel is just pulling all the weight and the other wheels are doing nothing like that. It's a hammer blow because every time it gets to that hard spot, it's no longer smoothly going. So the whole oh, wheel goes bang. It's, it's, oh, I see. Okay. So it's just like they're normally like the wheels are supporting it. And then it gets to that one spot and boom, all the weight train. And then it goes back to everything normal and then boom, all the weight and then back. God, right. that would be violent sounding, wouldn't it? 
Yes, very violent sounding. We actually have a decent sized flat spots on one of our diesel locomotives right now from an issue with sticking brakes and sort of thing. And you, you feel it in the cab and you listen to it every time it hits that flat spot. It goes, duh, duh, duh. And it's like, oh man. Right, Mark. So unfortunately the uh, the wheels were also on their last size. So we actually have to buy new wheels for so, it now. But talking about wheels, we might as well talk about this because people may or may not notice depending on how in tune they are with their cars and stuff. Um, every car, whenever you buy a rim or a new tire, uh, you gotta go ahead like two. Uh, one and a half. I can't. I can't see what's no, loaded. That's fine. In one and a half. So, uh, keep going. Keep going. Okay, stop. Uh, but every time you, if you buy a car, if you buy a new rim, you buy a new tire, whatever you put on a car, the, the automotive manufacturer, not the ma well, whoever makes the tire and puts the tire in your car, has to do what's called balancing the tire, right? And if you look on the, you can go to any car in any parking lot, doesn't matter. And you can go and if you look on the inside of your rim, somewhere on the inside of your rim, glued to the inside of your rim, you'll see these little, looks like fishing weights almost. So these little square weights. And they'll glue them to the inside of the rim. And that's basically because they put the tire on a big machine that spins it really fast and checks where the tire wobbles. And they put weights to adjust that for imperfections in the manufacturing, etc. So even though you think your rim is like perfectly flat, perfectly circular, it's not. And they're, they'll balance it with some weight so that your tire doesn't vibrate aggressively. Do you guys have, you must have the same thing with steam engines then, right? Like you must have an axle balancing thing to balance the axle weight because it's not going to be a uniform construction, right? I had to... ha have you have you ever stared at the wheels on the steam engines? Well, I know they have the big counterweight, like the big cast counterweight on the other side of the, the piston. The other yes. side. But that's it? Like, and they just, they shimmy that weight down if it's too much or they add more to it if it's... The, it is math done based on the rods and anything else will be close enough there is no adjustment there's they any, don't any, add little weights like and stuff like that no. they don't they don't care it's just all right you're ahead too no. by the way ahead too so that's it they just they're just like this is as close as it is and if it's slightly off it's slightly off who cares type thing yeah because the the wheels don't get going that stupid fast that was a head half size. sir you need to go ahead uh, another half and oh, a bit okay oh okay 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 we're also just gonna take beams to the okay you're good stop we're just going to take... Oh, you went maybe too far? Probably too far. I got to go back half. Yeah, we're just going to take beams to the uh, the coal mine today. We can deal with the rails on, a, you know, another day. Sure. Give it a good dose of beams. It's beam got some rails added already, I know. Because um, I think it consumes beams faster than it consumes rails. Side note, it really just brings me joy to see a big round case electric headlight on an engine. All right. Like, Full steam ahead, sir. Thing. Full steam ahead. What is this, a boat? Yes. Oh, okay. Aye, Captain! I, cause full I, steam ahead! You'd never say full steam ahead on a train, but it's literally a steam train would be full steam ahead. Like, I don't... It, I don't it's true. I don't it's understand true, how it's it, any different it's, from a it's boat. A, it's, a, it's a naval term, so... It's actually kind of funny when you think about, like, big, big old school boats and old school trains, and then they're all the same. They're all just steam right. engines. And then the right. only reason they, like, I don't even know if there was a steam engine car ever, but I feel like the weight... There were. Been, there were. Well, I know there were the steam yeah. tractors. There, was were, there was actually a brand of cars called the Stanley Steamer, and they had a little miniature steam engine in them. And they would um, drive a they car were not with a steam engine. Super, super popular. Weren't super popular back in the day, but oh, yeah, gee, I wonder why. Engine, yeah. I, I, like, yeah. you know. Hey, lots we want to go. Is, we're gonna go to uh, to Billy's house up the street. Okay, let's do the 14 steps required to get our steam car working. Pretty much. I think they were actually more user friendly than you'd think, much more so than a locomotive. But I mean, you'd still have to fire still, a still coal fire enough, somehow, yeah. right? Like, I I want to say the Stanley Steamers actually still like, had a gas burner, so you could still fill them up at a gas station. Oh, so it was oil. Um, okay. Or yeah, it was like an oil fired steam engine. I, I, I don't know enough about those, so someone in the comments is going to correct me, I'm sure. But, That's amazing. Uh, there were many different flavors of that, and and the people still make contraptions like that to this day. There was a. Uh, an episode of like one of James May's at like side series or something where they went and looked at a steam powered Range Rover or Land Rover that someone had modified. And it's just like, well, that's way too cool. Watching the car start up and it's this big old Land Rover and it's got cylinder cocks and you've just got steam coming out from under the hood. And it's like, well, that's cool. <laughs> People have too much time on their hands if they're modifying yeah, well, Range Rovers to be steam powered. Well, you know, it's fun. I'm Some of us saying. are into that stuff, okay? It's pretty cool, though. It is pretty cool. I like the fact that there's all these electric headlights and stuff and regular headlights. I'm wondering when Railroads is going to get a day-night cycle. Because 
Yeah, that would, that would make, be interesting. That would be cool to run these trains at night and then into the daytime and whatever. And like, you know, I guess we've never really talked about that with old school railroading um, and new school railroading. I know there's like one train, for example, local to me that only runs at like 2 a.m. once a month to deliver something from some factory to somewhere. And it's right. like once a month you'll hear this train slow rolling through town at like maybe 40 kilometers an hour and it's it's just it's it's quiet because like they're you know they're in residential zones but it was we, me and my buddy we in university we actually had a house right across the street from this track and we set up a camera pretty much like every month and just you know had the train rolling by because like you know you could film it right and uh I'm just wondering if, like, you know, with, with modern trains, I mean, obviously there's, there's you know, issues with noise and stuff like that when you're going through residential zones. But with old trains, would it be like, just, you know, you got to do a 3 a.m. run and you're running your trains from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m.? Or, like, was there, do they try and keep it all in the daytime? Or would, did it matter? Or was it all, I got to get that switch for you. Trains ran when the trains needed to run. It didn't matter. And, that, was, that was it. They're just like you, you, you saw what go. you could see by, by the headlight, and when they were oil lights, I mean, a well-adjusted and set-up oil light actually throws more light than you would think. Right. But all headlights on steam locomotives are of the variety of the light is there for someone to see the train, not for the engineer to see where he's going, because it can only cast the light so far. Wouldn't you so if you're hit running a lot more like wild animals and stuff at night, though? That's, like that's what the whistle's for, my man. <laughs> but like you wouldn't see it coming. You just, you, you know, the the beam is actually surprisingly wide. It just doesn't go terribly far. It maybe goes a hundred yards or so. So if you're running twenty five plus mile an hour. Uh, your braking distance is longer than what you can see with the light. Right. So that's that's where the issue comes. But if someone's in the way or an animal gets on the track, I mean, you can see it far enough ahead that you can blow the whistle and, and get its attention. And uh, been there, done that, got the T-shirt. We had a, a deer at the Railroad Museum of all places. We had a big deer, big antlers and everything. It was a buck. Uh, get ahead of us and like was running down the track away from us and it was like go somewhere other than down the track please and yeah get off the, the gauge like sir that is not real practice <laughs> hey, you're not following good safety we're gonna have to have a safety talk with the deer afterwards yeah that's <laughs> funny you cannot tell how fast you're going by staring at, ahead at the track you have a vague idea but you really can't tell just how fast it is so, yeah but, um, I, but like you were saying Previously, if you're a good steam engine, steam locomotive driver, and you've driven your steam locomotive enough, you should be able to tell how fast you're going based on the chuffs. Yeah, but if you're going downhill or you're not working it super hard, you can't hear the chuffs. Oh, well, you so, know. So then you need something else. And so we actually, and this is part of that light video I was talking about, like 491 has this just exposed light bulb that's just underneath the cab. And it right. just looks like it's misplaced. It's just like this light bulb that just sticks out sideways. And it's like, well, why the hell is that there? Oh, it's so that you can tell how fast you're going at night because it's right below you. You can look down and see, oh, we're at a gallop or, oh, we're going way too fast. Oh, you can look down at the track through the, through yeah, the locomotive. Yeah, ex exactly. That's so it's kind of neat like that. The, the biggest issue, though, comes when firing because firing at night you're looking blinding? into the fire. It's blinding. You open the fire door and your eyes adjust to the bright light decently quickly. And then you go to go for a scoop of coal and you can't see the coal. Right. Like there, there is a deck light on the top of the inside of the cab so that you could see the coal pile. Um, it's not that bright. It's nowhere near as bright as the surface of the sun that is the fire. So you end up like you have these funny moments where you have no idea what coal you're getting. I knew uh, we were running 491 for Polar Express the one time. And, and like coal pressure. shovel, coal shovel, small right, children, right. coal small shovel. Small children, oh. whatever comes down goes in the box. Yeah. Man. Oh, no. Was... So, <laughs> so <laughs> I, we're going up the hill and my pressure's dropping. So I've got a hole in the fire somewhere that I didn't catch earlier. So I know I need coal fast. And so I go for a scoop and I see and I, I, I looked, I looked at the fire, saw where the hole was, went for the scoop got a big meaty heavy scoop of coal and i go to fling it in and i finally see the coal as i'm going through the fire door and it's of course like the front right so i'm hitting it as fast as i can and i have one gargantuan piece of coal on my scoop like a basketball sized piece of coal and i immediately stop my throw and pull the shovel up throw it back towards the tender and get a different scoop because it's like I'm going to impale the brick arch with this thing and break the arch brick in the locomotive if I chuck that basketball up there at 50 mile an hour. Like, that's a bad day. 
when did speedometers on locomotives become a thing? When that was is that? a great question because no none idea. of mine have them. <laughs> I think uh, the 5629, which is the big steam engine we have at the museum, it doesn't run because it's a giant sand gauge engine. Um, it was built in the 40s, has one. Okay. But um, none of our stuff, even built 1928, has them. And a lot of engines didn't get them, and they're still not required unless you're going more than 25 mile an hour with one, I'm pretty sure. So like even a on lot modern of engines, diesels, it's not required unless you're... Uh, no, on, on steam engines. Diesels, oh, okay. I believe, they're all required regardless on diesels. Yeah. Right. The nuance of trying to get one that works decently is actually kind of an interesting challenge on a steam engine if you think about it. Because you can't go off of a central hub on one of the drivers because the rods would cleave it off. Right. Let me know when I'm clear of the, the switch there. Yeah, I can't yeah. see so the end So what the would they put it off of? Would they put it off like the pilot or something or... So the one that the, I saw on 5629, the wheels, whatever the heck it is, well, the one that I saw on the 5629 was on one of the drivers, right? Um, and it was like a pulley right, you're good. on a on a on a spring, and so it sprung against the tire itself, and that was the way that they read the speed. And the the interesting so wait, question it was like a becomes, wheel running along the side of the tire. Is that on the top of the tire, on the tread of the tire? So on the top of the tire, they would run a wheel that would spin in the opposite direction. They would measure the speed off that correct That's and i don't weird. know i don't know it was kind of weird and i'm not entirely certain how they account for tire thickness because the tires i mean they have about three inches on the radius well it'd be the same way your car three inches, does it, right your, your well yeah well your car well, speedometer is based if you take a standard car and you just throw a bigger rim on it like with a bigger tire then you mm -hmm. need to get your speedometer adjusted because otherwise now your car thinks it's going faster and if you don't believe me go to a burnout on ice and rev your engine as high as it'll go and let your tires free spin and it'll say you're going like 120 kilometers an hour when you're not. Yeah, so I uh, I changed the rims on my GTO. And you never changed the speedometer? Never, never changed the speedometer. So and, now you uh, just you just go faster than it says is basically. Uh, I go I actually go I, I'm going slower than it says because I thought you made um, them smaller? Yeah, so th this is the funny thing. So the car originally had some aftermarket rims on it that I hated when I bought it and I thought they were 14 inch rims all the way around because old muscle car 1960s right 14 right. inch stock rims was the thing but it had 14s in the front and 15s in the rear anyway I changed from 14s and 15s to all 14s because I found a set of 1968 rally two rims uh, which ended up I loved the look and I hoped that they were accurate for my car and I ended up getting the original uh, specs of my car and they were accurate the, the car was delivered with those so it felt cool that I was doing the historical right thing, having those tires or, or those rims, and then I could, you know, do whatever with it. But uh, because it changed it, yeah, it says I'm doing about three or four mile an hour faster yeah. than I actually am. Because uh, it's just your, funny, your so. speedometer on your car is based on engine RPMs and, and uh, gear, I believe. It's not... It shouldn't be engine RPMs because... Well, it's based on the it's the speed after the transmission. I thought is what it is. Right, right. So which I mean, is it, your gear you plus speed engine when you're RPM equals speed mean. after transmission yeah. at, on that shaft, and then it does math based on your tire size. Was my understanding of that? Right, right. Because it it's based off of what the output shaft and everything is going to yeah. be doing. Yeah, which you can but adjust. It, it's not that tied math, to but... it's it's not tied to engine speed because uh, you know you could be an idle. You could rev in neutral. Yeah, yeah. No, neutral, sorry. Yeah, I meant yeah. like it's like engine speed right after the transmission drive. Right, is where, right. Where that's yeah. A lot of modern diesel locomotives have electronically controlled air brakes. Right. So you're you're moving a, a an encoder that talks to a computer that talks to the valves that actually make the air change. And so PTC can just plug into that electronic air brake computer and talk to it and say, hey, this is what I need you to do. And they have encoders on the valves to measure valve position or is it like a solenoid that's just open or closed? Uh, it's it's an encoder, I believe, that measures the position of the handles that talks right. to the computer, yeah. Um, Although, you know, it might be part of a solenoid too because th those systems, if the computer breaks, they work in what's called pneumatic backup where the valves still work mechanically entirely. And I'm not sure how that works. Have you ever, but, uh, ever taken apart an encoder stuff. before? You know how an encoder I, works? I have not. Okay, nerd nerd alert. This, so the, I worked with encoders all the time because I worked in robotics. And robots on every motor, they have an encoder. And the the reality of it is really simple it's how do you measure where the motor position is right 
And by knowing where all the motor positions on a robot are, you can do some math, you can do some trigonometry. It's actually called a transformation matrix. It's a four by four matrix. And if you do the math correctly, any four by four matrix will take XYZ input and give you an XYZ output. So you go a three by one XYZ input matrix, multiply it by your motor positions, and it gives you an output matrix that tells you, here's the angles that every single motor needs to be at to get to that position XYZ with, I think it's XYZ with a rotation angle. Um, okay. And there's math, and, and it's a nasty looking matrix based on the dimensions of your robot. You end up with these equations that are like sine theta one, cos theta two times distance of arm one, blah, blah. And it's just like each, right, right. each position in this matrix is nonsense. But you can derive what that, that transformation matrix is for a robot, and then that robot transformation matrix basically becomes its law. And the nice thing about that is it's very simple math to do. Matrix math is very quick. It can be done by a computer very quickly. So you can feed a robot one thing, it'll give you the output angles, and then the encoders drive the motors to those angles, moves the robot. But the encoder itself is actually a disc with holes in it, and it's binary holes, and it has light on one side and a sensor on the other. And based on the position of the motor, where the disc is, it it shines a certain amount of light through certain hole positions and that tells the motor exactly where it is. So a more accurate encoder will have more slices and more more little holes where all the lines can line up and a less accurate encoder will have less. So if you have an encoder that's only accurate to let's say one degree, it has to have 360 different combinations of holes around it, right? You want one that's half a degree, it needs 720 combinations of holes, right? And so it's a really simple system. But yeah, it's light on one side and a, a photo eye on the other, and that's all it does. At least the, the ones I work with. I'm sure there's more modern solutions now with, you know, who knows, but... Well, that's, that's really nifty. I yeah, know but it was literally, literally, it's just like a literally, so if you pull the encoder out, you see this disc on the back of the motor, and it's literally a disc that's full of these little, like, like little dot holes, and they're in a binary matrix right so it's like you know your first hole will be just a one zero 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 they're all they all follow a simple binary pattern and that's how you can determine exactly where your motor is to you know that position getting to the uh the ptc piece of it right so that the electronic air brakes encoders or whatnot ptc could just talk to right right but there's a ton of locomotives out there actually probably more than have electronic air brakes still that run what's called 26l which is pretty much the most widespread, but uh, modern, but still entirely pneumatic air brake system. So when you're grabbing that the automatic brake valve or you're grabbing your independent, you're grabbing a physical valve handle, modulating a valve that has a, an actual, kind of like your encoder, has different slots and holes in a rotary valve, letting air do different things. And so there's no computer, there's no way, like you can't tell it to do anything with software, but you can tell the outputs to do things with software by using magnet controlled valves. And so rather than being able to control complex things with the brakes, PTC on those engines, they have a mag valve on the brake pipe so they can put it to emergency by making the brake pipe just open to the atmosphere and make it go to zero. And then they have Another valve that's on one of the different pipes in the actual air brakes themselves. I never really learned 26L enough to tell you which pipe it is, but that is the penalty pipe. And so when you uh, energize that valve or, or de-energize rather with PTC, it dumps it and then you end up getting a penalty brake application that reduces the brake pressure to from like 90 to something like 60. So it's a less uh, less violent brake application because going into emergency is it's pretty violent and can cause derailments and, and can cause things to break. So they did have to figure that out on more mechanical systems. So it is theoretically possible to equip a steam engine with PTC knowing that stuff because PTC just controls the brakes at the end of the day. But how would you control um, the main throttle the valve? You don't need to. What, That's someone just sets the throttle and then you just let the brakes? PTC does not drive the train. PTC is a, the engineer screwed up and I need to brake for him system. Oh, okay. Got, even That's on modern it. stuff, that's all it is. Even it's on just... modern, that's all the PTC does. There is a separate program called Trip Optimizer that GE has on their locomotives where you put the throttle at run eight and then the software runs the train. And uh, every engineer that's ever used it will tell you it's a pile of junk and, and they hate it. And they're, they're pretty much right. It does, and, and theoretically, stuff, it's but... supposed to modulate the throttle to be as efficient as possible. When... Yes, hence why it's called Trip Optimizer. But uh, the electronics don't know everything that a real engineer knows. Still, right. 
But there's especially, a lot of especially things for running like long wear train. and tear on the engine is very hard for electronics right. to monitor. Right. So, or uh, wear and tear on your load, what you're pulling, where you're pulling, track condition. These are all things right, that right. electronic systems can't really evaluate. Exactly. And, and so uh, most engineers out there, and, and let us know in the comments down below. I know there's a lot of engineers on the class one that watch this. Uh, everyone I've talked to says they hate Trip Optimizer, and they've got a funny nickname for it that I can't repeat on YouTube. So anyway, gotcha. uh, <laughs> what else is new? Um, but theoretically, with Trip Optimizer and PTC, you could have a train that could run itself. And that's probably where the industry is going. There are trains that do operate themselves uh, in Australia and the Outback, there's an iron ore railroad that has entirely autonomous trains. Um, so it's definitely a possibility and the way the industry is looking, I mean, I'm sure that is going to be knocking on our door sooner rather than later. So, so thinking of PTC and steam, I mean, where I was going with earlier, UP put steam, or they put PTC on the big boy, but the way that they did it was so that it uses all the electronics from the diesel behind it. So they're really running the PTC off of the diesel behind it with an extra, you know, 180 or 200 foot long fence right. in front of the GPS antenna to say, hey, there's a whole, you know, there's a water car and a tender and a locomotive ahead of us. You might need to change that switch before you run through it because otherwise you're going to go into the, the small little lead track. Right. That's fine. It's fine. Still fine? Probably fine. I, I think so. Yeah, because otherwise you're going to end up We might the... try in Tokyo Drift. Yeah, and then you got to, there we go. We got to push this all forward. Perfect. Again, well, that should make us some money. Loaded. It is. It is. Yeah. We're gonna have enough space. It's gonna. It's only. It stores thirty beams, which is ten cars. But we did have rails left over, and it's already consumed like a ton of beams. So, yeah, there's actually still rails right here. So. Yeah. So we're still. We're good. This will be a lot of coal. Be nice. That will be nice. We'll have to keep we'll our coal prepped. coal mine actually stocked, and then we'll do rails next time and make sure we get you know all the rails. Yeah, we honestly might as well leave this train here because we can go straight from here down the ten percent to the smelter and then come back up. Um, <laughs> The harrowing 10%. Yeah, we're going to have to do it uh, together this time. Not yeah, one it'll, at it'll time. be fine if we yep. do it together. I think, like, you know, I can run along and do brakeman stuff. Now, why are you coming this way? I needed to come this way. Where are you going? Sir, this is not... Then Hold you, on. Why let did me, you go this way? Let me do another Let me do another crazy kickflip maneuver here. Oh, I almost did it. No, I didn't. Look at you it. almost been... landed it. <laughs> come on, God. It was close. It was close, man. Wait, you were close. already on the other leg of the Y. Why did you do that? Well, because I was going to go I was gonna go this way and clear out this Oh, way. God, this thing is a speedy boy. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is a dunk. This is a dunk. This is a dunk. Did you derail it? Uh, No. I don't know how, but that was uh, that was spicy. Yeah, this is this is, uh, this setup might need a change. We might need to put. You know what we should do? Honestly, I might change this setup later on my own time. But see where we've got this lead track here, and then this switch here, and then yep. this switch here. We should take this switch right here, the one I'm standing on, which you probably can't see anymore. But we should turn it into a three-way switch. Oh, three-way switch. And then you would come nice off there. this, and then you could pick either of the two lines, and then we won't need this lead anymore because you could go out that way, or you could go out that way. You know what I mean? And then that right, would be right. that would be the place to do it, I think. But yeah, we gotta get a coal thing down at the um, at the uh, roundhouse, and then we'll have to deliver coal from the coal mine to that to have it right. set up. Right. But yeah, let us know what you guys think in the comments down below, and uh, like, subscribe. We'll, we'll see you all next time. time. Yeah, thanks for watching, everybody. Bye. Bye.